Darable Fest 2021 is a four-day celebration of innovation and independent streaming series. We're a creator convention, bringing you the most relevant production workshops, panel discussions, giveaways, and an industry marketplace connecting the next wave of indie series to execs at AMC Networks, Blumhouse, Disney TV Animation, and more. We're a festival, screening your new faves. From rich fantasy to absurdist comedy, hosting an award ceremony, and several parties to kick it with your fellow fans and creators alike. Hello, hello again, and welcome to another wonderful Starable Fest event, this time an AMA, Ask Me Anything, with Jay Francis, the VP of Original Series and Diversity at Disney TV Animation, brought to you, spoiler alert, by Disney TV Animation. So a couple of, you know, fun housekeeping up front, but I know we want to get to the conversation, so I promise I'll be quick. So Starable Fest, our favorite film festival, is the premier annual indie TV and web series festival in the United States and the new home for digital creative talent in the TV industry. They honor the year's best content and provide a space for the next generation of creators to connect with industry executives, grow their network, and learn new skills, plus course, the all-important building of communities. Starable Fest is presented by Dell Technologies with NVIDIA, making workstation and monitor solutions pr purpose-built for creators just like you. And we'd also like to thank our other sponsors and partners, AMC Networks, Disney TV Animation, shout out, Rizzle, and just for laughs, for making Starable Fest 2021 possible. So for those of you who were in the most recent event, my name is Brie Castellini, and I will be your moderator for all of the questions that you all have for our wonderful guest. I am actually the former Starable Community Director and current Seed and Spark Film Community Manager at the film crowdfunding platform, as well as an adjunct professor for digital media and web series. So I am right at home. I'm also a writer director of web series in my own right, and I'm a podcaster. I co-host a filmmaking podcast called Breaking Out of Breaking In. So who who knows? Maybe you'll find your next sex podcast there. Without further ado, I would love to welcome our guest, the man himself, Jay Francis, Vice President of Current Series and Diversity at Disney T Television Animation. Jay, I am excited to talk. Hey, how's it going, Bree? Good to see you. <laughs> We it's good to see you. Too. We don't live far away from each other now. So. I know. <laughs> we just found that out, despite the virtual space, our Very geographic cool. space isn't all that different. Absolutely. So, um, as we let folks kind of wander into the auditorium, virtual or otherwise, uh, and get settled, uh, I wanted to to ask you about your job title, which is pretty long, I think. Uh, so, I wanted to break it down together. Um, when you meet people from outside the industry, how do you describe your work to them when yeah. like, you say that title and maybe they're not familiar? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, that that's kind of an interesting story. You know, uh, about four years ago when I got promoted, um, one of the things that I was looking to do was to um, sort of expand some of the stuff that I was doing. And, and one of the things that I had sort of missed was sort of the interaction with people outside of, you know, um of disney with regard to up and coming talent i used to be the recruiter at film roman so my job was to go to schools and find people who wanted to work on the simpsons and king of the hill and family guy so it's as as fun as you might think it is with regard to that so um and you know div obviously diversity uh, uh initiatives and strategies had always been sort of something that uh most people who are who fall into that category are underrepresented and that's a broad that's a broad category to be sure but I know that in the business I've chosen um, I, I was happy to sort of help shepherd that along what I didn't know is they were going to put the, that term in my title so oh you, know, you didn't actually uh, know that they, uh, they uh, snuck it in there. you know I guess to a certain degree playing in that little sandbox but I figured that was going to be sort of my uh, my little hobby on the side because, um, you know, my job, my, my, I guess for lack of a better term at the time, my primary job was working as a creative executive on the different series that we were producing. So for me, um, I've been the, the uh, creative executive on Phineas and Ferb for years. Um, I was on Big City Greens and Amphibia 
and a couple of others. And when I took on when I took on this role, um, I and ha and I and I say this happily, there was a lot more involved and a lot more to do to get involved with our strategies and, and initiatives at TV Animation, and it actually broadened into more of the at the time. Disney Channel, but what we, what we now call uh, Disney branded television. So, um, so the the overall title includes the fact that I am still have a foot in the creative side because I still you'll still find me in some development meetings. You'll still find me in some current series meetings. Um, my primary focus is certainly our our DEI work, but um, there is the story of my my job and my title. No, I love that. Um, so with that, given that, you know, both you were surprised perhaps with the the specific auspices of your new position, what does a typical day look like for you? You know, when you go into the office next sure. Monday morning, what happens? Well, you know, so um, I wish I was going into the office next Monday morning. Well, but sure. I virtual <laughs> office. Fair enough. <laughs> um, um, what's great about this job is that there is actually no normal day. You know, I think the reality is for me, um, a lot of the work that we do comes from the standpoint of what is necessary at the time. So, um, you know, as far as my responsibilities, I look at it from the standpoint that this week, like any corporation, you have your blued out Outlook calendars that say this is a weekly meeting, so you need to be there, which, you know, which I have. But you know, the biggest part of my job is to leave my schedule a little bit open because a big part of my job is connecting with talent. Um, and whether that's from festivals like this, whether this is from a school outreach or interacting with folks from a writing program or plain and simple, people on social media reaching out and saying, hey, can I get a meet and greet? I'd love to ask you my advice. So. Um, um, so I'm, I, I'm always sort of, uh, diligent with the idea of like, we can't just load up my calendar because I want to be able to sort of connect with, um, uh, with talent wherever I can find that. So, but, you know, as part of a development team, you know, you go to pitches, you give notes on premises, outlines, storyboards, you are, you know, as a, as a, as a creative executive, um, it's your job to have every aspect, every asset, every bits and piece of knowledge of what's happening with the show um, pretty much at your fingertips, at your command. And certainly if you don't know, you have the ability to find out. So it was very important to me as I sort of took on this expanded role to be able to still have a foot in the creative because I felt like if I was going to go out to schools, if I was gonna go out to give presentations or podcasts or what have you, if I was looking for talent, I wanted to be able to talk to the talent based on specifically what I know to be true in our division. So, you know, if I'm talking to a writer and I talk about the fact that, hey, you know, our writer rooms need to be more balanced now, you know? Um, it's not just coming from the standpoint of like, because I think it needs to be, it's because no, I'm, I'm in these writer rooms, so I know. And while, you know, we've come a long way and I, and I love how far we've come, there's still a lot more work to do, but it was important to me to still have my finger on the pulse of what was going on creatively and also be able to use that knowledge to inform um, the talent that's looking for specific uh, answers to their questions. That's really wonderful. I wish more managers had that perspective. Um, so when you say that you have been the creative executive for Phineas and Ferb for many seasons and have been that before, what does that mean like functionally? Like what is your place in the creative process Absolutely. and how are you? Involved? So the, 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 the best way to describe it is that as a creative executive, you, you know, as I said, you have this sort of overall broad knowledge of everything that's going on with the show because you're going to be interacting with every different stakeholder within the company. But specifically, your interactions are mostly had with the show creators, the, the EPs, the story editors, the writers, um, the production personnel, the crews. And, you know, 
I think the way I describe my job is you're the first eyes and ears of the audience. So, you know, that first three line premise about this, the first story that the, that the team wants to write, that's going to come to myself and my, you know, um, my second, my second in command. And we're going to sort of, Hey, that sounds good. Or, Hey, sounds good. One question did blah, 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 blah. And sort of send that back to them. Premise goes to outline, outline goes to script. And in each part of the process, we're there to sort of, once again, give notes on, on that particular um, asset that's being created. As a creative executive, you are at every single pitch. You are at every single writer's meeting. You are giving feedback on, on uh, rough cuts. You are giving feedback on character design. You are giving feedback on music, casting choices. Um, all of that is sort of in the context of you're collaborating with the production team. So my job isn't to, you know, create, you know, sort of follow along with, you know, how many days it's going to take to do this storyboard. What, what I'm responsible for is that when we get that storyboard, we have 48 hours to give notes on that, because if we don't, we're holding up the assembly line to a certain degree, you know, so that's where so that's where the connection and the collaboration comes in with production you know if you expect them to keep a tight budget and tight schedule then we're all part of that same mechanism so it's important that we have that turnaround and look if you're overseeing four shows at once that gets a little bit dicey when three scripts come in and two outlines come in on this show and, and, and five premises come in in that show. Oh, and they need you down the hall because we're doing a pitch on, 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 on the main title sequence or, and there's a music meeting. Oh, we have auditions. I need you to listen to these auditions. And so, you know, so all of that sort of comes into play. That's in the initial stages as you're building the show, as you're getting closer to a particular air date or a screening, now you're starting to interface with with your sort of network executives, whether it's the programmers, whether it's the marketing team, the on-air promos folks, the media relations folks. You know, that's really where you now have to sort of shift your lens a little bit. The shows are still being produced, so you can't, you know, you don't give up on that. But now there's an overlap. There's the overlap sure. in the actual pre-production side, and now you're getting the show ready for uh screening or premiere or, or or what have you which you know certainly the line has blurred now with regard to with the streaming and what have you it's like where all this plays in and who you're talking to now at what point it's a little bit different but it's it's basically if anybody had a question about any sort of specific information on phineas and ferb their first phone call would be to me you, so you're like the high level expert and liaison for the the show and all the things that need to happen to make that show go to go to market. Absolutely, yes. Perfect. That's cool. So uh, I want to back up because something you said reminded me as a teacher who just had my students pitch log lines to me that I really am curious. So you said the that you know you're the first person that reads the first three sentences. When you are receiving like a log line for the first time, a, a high level synopsis for a new project, what are the things you're looking for out of that? How would you tell someone what makes a good log line? You know, uh, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I I feel like you know a lot of the shows that I've worked on because I have such an inherent knowledge of what the show is that I don't even really think about that because. Phineas and Ferb, for example, it's like we 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 all know what's going to happen here, right? This is like Phineas and Ferb are going to be doing their thing, Doof and Perry are going to be doing their things, Candace is going to be somewhere in the middle, and at some point, two things are going to happen. All of the the all of the plot lines are going to come together, and there's going to be a song or two somewhere in there. So, I think for me though, it's just the you know, and especially when you have a a a collaborative and respect relationship with your crews, then it's less about, you know, what I'm looking for. And it's just sort of the basic, here's what this story is going to be about today, you know, because a premise can be something as short as, you know, again, when you sort of, once you get familiar with the show, you, you, you can shortcut things. It's just like, um, I don't 
Denise, what about for new shows? Like, oh, yeah. Brand yeah. new ideas. I mean, it's it's more of a, perhaps more of a, like a paragraph where you, okay. you say, you know, you want to get to a certain degree whenever you can. It's what is the beginning, the middle, and the end. You know, so even when you're talking about it from a script standpoint or a premise standpoint, outline, ultimately you want to be able to, you know, sort of ascertain what's the beginning, what's the middle, what what happened, what's going to happen in this show. Um, and at a premise stage, it's hard to really sort of give any more judgment than, uh, okay, there may not. So that's why to, to answer your question, it's a little bit challenging because it's like, I don't look for anything necessary in the log line other than the fact that if you're telling me the story has nothing to do with Phineas and Ferb, I'm probably going to question that, you know, if it's a Phineas Ferb or it doesn't, you know, or the main, the, the, the main character isn't somehow sort of not necessarily always the focus of the, uh, of the story, but what is that character's point of view? Because, because that's what, that's what this show really sort of runs on the, the, the character motivation for like an amphibia where it's Anne as the lead character is always going to be front and center. It may be a sprig story, or it may be, you know, a, 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 another character's story this time. But I think ultimately you're still going to be looking at, you know, what is the lead character's presence in this? So, it's hard sometimes to get that from a log line, but basically there's that where that trust factor comes in. It's just like, oh, those guys get it. So I'm, I don't have to, I don't have to dig too deep into that. Sure. So obviously you're very creatively involved in a way that I think a lot of people newer to the industry might not be familiar with when the word executive is trotted out. So I'm curious, like wh where did your career start? Were you always interested in working in film and television broadly? Did you want to be more on the creative side versus the executive side? How did we come to have this conversation, Jay? Yes. What's the path? So the, you know, if I, if I'm going to go all the way back to do it, all the way back, because you know I'm, I'm I'm certainly older than most folks here. But um, in high school, I was told I need to get an elective my junior year in high school, and there was this elective called film. That's basically what it was. Now I can remember, and it's just like all right, you know, let me look, like I need the elective. So the whole class was a breakdown, a a a breakdown of the movie It's a Wonderful Life, character, music, choices, you know, and I didn't even know like people do this. Like they take a movie, like don't they just watch it and enjoy it? So that was that was the first time that I thought, huh, there could be something here. That, that I obviously found it interesting, but could there be more to this in terms of a career? This was junior year in high school, so obviously you're getting ready for college. My assumption was, oh, liberal arts school, and I'll figure it out. That sort of changed the focus for me and not from a, okay, now I want to be a director. Now I want to be a producer. Now I'll be a writer. It was more just like, all right, well, there's, there's a, there's a path here other than just the, you know, so that changed the focus of what schools I was applying for. So instead of just any school that just, oh, I like their football team. It, it was more like TV and film communication schools. So all of a sudden there was a path, you know, Syracuse, NYU, UCLA, Boston University, those were now clearly the schools that I was looking at. And um, um, when I got into Syracuse, into the Newhouse School, um, even then there wasn't this very, there wasn't this specific want of, I want to do this. Back in 19, okay, dating myself now, back in 1980, when I went to school, like the entertainment industry was TV and film, you know, and Upon graduating from Syracuse, I still didn't have a clear vision. So I was like, I'm going to just go to L.A. and look for a job in the entertainment industry. That was, I've now just told you what my strategy was. You know, <laughs> go to L.A. and get a job in the entertainment industry. And and right before we started this, I told you about, you know, back in those days, you weren't uploading your resume to companies. And you weren't, you know, you didn't have a cell phone and you didn't have digital, like, you went out there with a briefcase full of resumes. You went out with a map, a physical map, Thomas Guide, whatever, and um, a book of addresses of places that you thought, let me drop my resume here. There was never once the moment in that where I thought, 
let me go to this place because I want to be a writer or let me write a script. But, you know, it was just, you just wanted to be involved. I just wanted to be involved. And I didn't even know what involved meant, quite honestly. So, uh, sure. so that's what got me sort of in the path. I will say that, you know, as far as animation goes and how I ended up there, um, that wasn't even on my radar at all. Like animation for me, I, like most people, I'd grown up with cartoons, but I never once thought about cartoons as any aspect of a career, even as I went out to LA to, to look for, for a job. The, the long and the short of it is, you know, I was on a bus in Hollywood and I was going to a place for those who are uh, familiar with LA, to a, to a place called Studio City. Why? Well, because I thought there were studios in Studio City, because coming up on the East Coast, why would they name something Studio City? Um, on the bus from Hollywood over the Coanga Pass into Studio City, and if you did that bus ride in 1984, the first company, the first entertainment company you would have seen that you would have taken note of was the old Hanna-Barbera studios. And I just remember like the Yogi Bear flags and Fred Flintstone and all and Jetsons and all that stuff. And that's when light bulb popped up over my head on that bus was, well, these guys have more on TV than anybody else I'm going to give a resume to. So why not? You know, I have no idea in my head. Like, I don't know that there's a place for me. I'm not an artist. I don't write. So, but so I got the bus, I walked in, and the, the receptionist there, who I think saw me coming from a mile away, and it was almost like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Not again. Not I one of these ones. Not, I, but, but she said, and I still remember this to this day, but two companies that are always hiring, and she wrote down the addresses of these two small animation studios. She assumed that I was looking for a job in animation. I didn't dissuade her of that. And so, you know... Um, I got the addresses. I and and I, I one of them I couldn't find. The other one <laughs> happened to be in Studio City of all places, and it was the co it was a company called Deke D I C way back in the day, and they had they were doing Inspector Gadget and ultimately did real Ghostbusters and uh, you know other cartoons, and I ended up getting a production assistant job at that small animation studio. So you know. Partly when I tell this story, I sort of reference the fact of, you know, I was kind of lucky. But then on the on the flip side of that, it's like I always think to myself, back in New York or Boston, if I had even thought about animation, I was like, oh, yeah, well, let me send a resume to these. Like, it would have just ended up on that gigantic pile of sure. resumes, right? Actually going to where the jobs were. And I know it's a different world now. Put aside pandemic for a second, emails and the access to information that you know from from your from your desk seat. I get it, but I, I, I'm still a firm believer in you know personal connections, personal interactions. Like I, that woman gave me the address. She will never know how she changed the course of my life because <laughs> I still say to this, like when I got the job, I said, "Yeah, I'll just do this until I get a real entertainment job." And I never left. I've worked at different companies. I've done different jobs. But that choice, that that way that I approached that in my ignorance and naivety or whatever else you want to call it, is why I'm here today. And and then I just like, you know, once you get in, you just follow the path. I mean, sure. I think that I started in production, ultimately went to recruiting, had tried my own company for a little bit. Went to when I got into Disney, it was with the it, it was development. Moved over, went in Disney development, the current series, to where I am today. So um, I just sort of followed the path, and you know, part of the reason I stayed in animation was really twofold. Number one, it was I just I fell in love with the art form and the process of creating animation. But number two, which is probably more important, it was the people. The people who worked in animation, whether it was on the kids side or a prime time space, you know, m m the way I describe people, generally speaking, in animation is like 
they take their jobs incredibly seriously. Like we have deadlines, we have budgets, we have the intensity and the scrutiny of that any other sort of, you know. Um, so they take their jobs seriously, but they don't take themselves seriously. And I think that is- An the, important distinction. Yeah, because I think the reality is, is that no matter what job I did, no matter what company I went to, Typically, it was fun, and 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 it was working with these people. It's part of the appeal of this business, where you can get your creative juices flowing, and yet still sort of like, it still feels like you know we're still just making cartoons, you know. And especially when you're talking about the in in the kids space, I mean, it just feels like, you know, it's less corporate. There's just more <laughs> sort of casualness to it, and I think it's just been it it's been the right fit for me. Well, that's really lovely to hear. And well, speaking of that personal connection, we actually have a question from the audience. So uh, Sarah, can we bring Ari on stage for a question? Hey, how's it going? All right, hi Ari. Hey hi. dude, how are how's you? Thank you for doing this. Uh, My pleasure. What's so yeah, on? quick question. Uh, how often do you guys option and develop outside ideas or are most ideas developed internally? And if you do develop outside pitches, are they primarily from production companies or sometimes from individual writers? Great question. Um, so it's interesting that in the TV space, especially in the kids program, we're, I, I think it's not all, but we're, we're one of the few places that still sort of go outside for pitches. Yeah, we have, you know, we have certainly we have uh, people who we've brought in in terms of overall deals and we have develop, internal development. Sure. Um, I think every studio would need to do that. But we still, um, you know, part of the process of development, tr trying to find the next Gravity Falls, find the next Phineas and Ferb, just may not be in your studio, may not be in your shop. And, and I will even take that a step further may not be in Los Angeles either or New York. So I think part of that is, you know, I think if you're doing your job as a development executive and we have great executives at Disney, they're searching all over the place for that, for that new idea. Now, that being said, yeah, for the most part, because our brand is, in terms of what we look for in, in shows for Disney Channel, Disney Junior, and now Disney Plus, most of the best pitches come from that personal connection, that personal experience that the show creators bring into the table, which you don't really find when a when a production company is bringing it in. It's been like, you know, and it's not to say the project doesn't have some, a project like that doesn't have some need to it, but when you start to sort of like, well, who's really the driver behind this show? which in essence turns into who's really the driver behind this character. You know, you typically can't get an answer for that because it's been sort of a group sort of like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this character did, and, and you can package all that up. So, so generally speaking, we don't do a lot of production company. It's not to say we don't do it at all. And it really depends on the circumstances and the situations. It depends on what we're looking for at the time. Um, but generally speaking, in our space, was as we look for new properties, and again, because Disney, we have like two parallel lines of thought. We have the original stuff that we're looking for from pitches from whether it's writers, artists, creators. You know, in animation, obviously, the line blurs oftentimes. Writers are artists, artists are writers. Um, but we, in that we are Disney, we have all of our heritage IP. And that's the stuff that we tend to develop in-house. So when you, you know, we did a reboot of um, uh, DuckTales a few years ago. So the, the, we, didn't, we didn't go to the outside necessarily to look for takes. We had people specifically who had worked with us before, who had, had established reputations for show creation and whatnot. And if it felt like that was the person to go to to get different takes, we would do that. So we certainly get different takes, but I think ultimately our our heritage IP stuff is something that we tend to keep in house as far as development goes. That makes Great. a lot of fun. Thanks.
Well, All right. Well, thanks, Sorry. Thanks for asking yeah. the question. So uh, you, you've you talked a lot um, in this conversation, Jay, about how much you love animation and how excited you are by that space, even if it wasn't necessarily where you originally imagined yourself. So I'm curious on a creative side of things, what do you think sets animation apart as like a storytelling device? And what's really exciting in the animation space right now in general? Well, you know, I think the, the you know, you always have, it's always interesting to hear, it's like, you know, writers and whatnot, oh, I, I love animation because in animation, you can do anything. You like, you can go to the moon and you can, and it's just, and I always, I, I, I sort of laugh at that a little bit because it's like, yeah, you know, we have our own budgets too, you know, it's not like you can do anything. Like if you have, uh, if you want to tr try to describe a hundred thousand soldiers coming down a hill, like, we're not doing a hundred thousand soldiers. You, know? you can put you that. Have to pay all the extras, but there's still costs but, associated. But, but, but it's just like the drawing, the designs. I mean, there's sure. like you know, there's sort of limitations. But I think what what is so appealing about animation, and again, I, I'm I'm going to talk more about the the a little bit more of the process because when you talk about animation and art in general, you're talking about something very personal, you know, and even if it's on a show that you know, or it, it, even if it's a show that you don't feel has that sort of, oh, that's unique special look to a show. It may, may, may look a little bit gritty or whatnot, but there's still an art to that. And it still means um, in sort of the colloquial sort of, it still means pencil to paper, you know? Uh, and I find that, that, you know, that process is still, just just incredibly amazing to me that you know we start with this piece of paper and you have people like drawing these designs and i think the most fascinating thing in terms of the animation process even when you're looking at either background design or character design is like the start point the rough drawings that and where you ultimately get to it's like that whole process is just amazing and i will tell you that you know those rough drawings, I would take those and frame those if they, you know, if they allowed me to, because that to me is how just incredibly creative people are and to sort of put this together. So, you know, from a storytelling standpoint, you know, I, I gotta be truthful. I mean, when I'm reading a script, um, it's part of the reason that when I'm, when I'm looking for samples from writers, I get a lot of live action, um, I get a lot of live action uh, samples and I'm okay with that. Because really, to me, um, I think the heavy lifting in a good script is creating a character that connects to your audience. I mean, we all have ideas. We all can plot out something, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not a writer, but I can plot out, like, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. You know, why does a script connect with you just from a read? You know, it tends to be the characters. I mean, I always use this, uh, this analogy of, like, you know, especially when it comes to pitching, it's just like, yeah, it's, you know, it's this whole world where it's it's like a high school on Mars and this happens and it's, and it's like, yeah, all right, well, that's an interesting backdrop, you know, but what is going to sustain, like, like once you get used to the high school on Mars, what is going to sort of drive you back to wanting to watch this show or like, it's the characters, it's your ability to connect with the characters it's the character dimensionality. That's the character sort of personality. It's the character's motivations and wants. Like, what does this character want? What is, what is driving this character to make the decisions that he or she is going to make? I often say, like, when I finish reading a script, it's not what I, it's not what the character did and said. I mean, that's part of it, but it's who the character is. I mean, that's I guess what I'm looking for. So. You know, with our brand, obviously, if, if folks are familiar with just our brand with regard to the TV animation side, you know, it's comedies with heart, comedy with heart. It's likable characters. Now, likable doesn't mean not flawed. Likable doesn't mean not conflicted. And likable doesn't mean not making poor choices. I mean, there are aspects of good storytelling and, and, and that you need to sort of create in, in there. But I think, you know, I think for us, the reality is I'm looking when I'm reading a script, whether it's an animation script for six to 11 or it's a live action script for 18 to 35 year olds, 
I'm still looking for the same things in, in character. I'm still looking to connect with that character. I'm, I'm looking for that likable character who is, you know, just trying to sort of figure it out. And, and if you can create that, whether it's an animation or live action, from my animation point of view, I'm saying, well, you got the, the you know, you're going to have to adjust to a six to 11 audience. And so your jokes may have to be a little different. It's a, it's a visual medium. So you have to think less about wall to wall dialogue and let the scenes sort of breathe a little bit. And, and, that, and that's where you, that's where you can get away with a lot of fun stuff in animation, just the stretch and squash and what you can do with a character. But ultimately, when I read a live action sample or sort of dealing with a live action character and I'm like so enthralled and I'm so connecting and I'm so, you know, it's relating, it's getting me related, relating to that character. It's like, well, if, if he or she can do it on this level, I'm sure they can write for DuckTales. I, I like, I, I don't have a concern that they, because they understand character. They understand right. the character layers, the dimensionality of the character, the character development. And so that's really what I hone in on when I'm reading a sample. And that's why, you know, oftentimes I get asked about, well, it's a little, it's more for adult audience, or it's a little sort of sexual innuendo. It's like, you know, I'm not offended by that. I'm offended by, you know, a bad script. I'm offended by okay. utilizing just gags without any sort of, you know, a real interest, giving the characters something to give introspection on, you know? So, um, and I'm not even offended by that. It's just like, eh, you know, it's just like, eh, all right, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's plot driven or it's just- Right, it's just a sample. It's not what you're literally gonna put on screen. You're just looking yeah, for, yeah. do you understand people? Yeah, and exactly. the people you understand, do I wanna watch them? Exactly. Uh, so we have another question from our audience um, that kind of harkens back to the, you know, it's about who you know sort of a thing. Uh, do you have any advice for building relationships with executives, especially ones you brush into at virtual events, wink, wink, or, and then connect with on LinkedIn? What do you, what do you say to start a conversation with busy people like yourself? Well, I mean, so I, it's, so the way I look at this is, um, and, and, and let's, and let's use LinkedIn as an example, because that's really this, my social media choice. You won't find me on Twitter or Facebook or, and certainly not. Well, you're probably better off for that. Mm -hmm. Just, <laughs> yeah, yes. um, you know, look, I, I made the sort of fundamental decision that, you know, part of this job meant, um, outreach, real outreach. And it also meant that when people reach out to you, you look at it as an opportunity. So I start with that perspective. So if you're reaching out to me, and I can only speak for me, but if you're reaching out to me, be mindful and humble that you're coming into somebody else's space and just, hey, I saw you at the terrible thing, would love to get half hour of time just to chat about and get some advice or that's all it takes for me, you know, and I do that a lot because, again, it's not only my job, but when I when I when I took on this expanded role, you know, I'm no diversity expert, and I didn't and I didn't have that sort of sense of like, oh, everyone, I got to do something now because it's in my title. It be it, it for me the most obvious step here was to say, okay, I don't even know what I don't know. So why don't I just listen to some people to, to just, whether it's students, whether it's people who are trying to break in, let me just hear what they say or what they think about perhaps Disney specifically, the animation industry in general, and just get a sense of like where people are on their journey, whether it's as writers, as artists, as two people trying to break in. And what I found out very specifically was people recognize that it's incredibly competitive to get into Disney. You know, and, and and for the most part, they, people understand that, and that, that does not that does not scare them away. The problem is, is that you know they don't feel like they ever got anyone to talk to to figure out how to compete. Meaning, like, what is that? What do I need to have in a portfolio in order to compete? What do what does my what do you look for in a sample in order for me to compete? What is it that I need to have on my resume, or what do I need to share that makes you look at me differently, perhaps from somebody else? Uh, that is what most people are looking for. And so, for me, 
that just meant, and we were talking about this earlier, just in terms of the fact that I leave my calendar open for just those type of discussions. It's why I do these type of events. Um, the, and so from that standpoint, my, my advice to reaching out to an executive is just be humble, be mindful, and just, and look, the, what's the worst case scenario? If it's on social media, you may just not get a response. All right. Mm -hmm. you know, like not everybody who has a LinkedIn profile goes to LinkedIn anymore. They probably forgot that. Or some, some people may not be into that. So the worst case scenario is like you don't hear back from them, but nothing lost there. And you just sort of keep at it. And I'd venture to say, especially now, and I and, and I think during the pandemic, it be you know, it was even a much greater want for everybody to connect in a certain way. So I know that I did a lot more postings during the pandemic because I was just trying to connect, to, 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 to beat the isolation, you know, to beat the idea that I couldn't leave this place even if I wanted to. So what am I going to do about that? You know, I have a loving family, a caring family, but there is still isolation that goes into all of us. So. And so I think a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily a had have time to to uh, have those conversations, but b I think they were just looking for that a little bit more. So my approach has always been just be honest, be truthful about what your intent is, and you know, and don't stalk. You know, if you don't hear from somebody, you don't hear from somebody. You know. I will leave it to you to sort of put the balance of like, well, maybe they didn't get it. So maybe I should try again. I think that's fine. You know, um, after that, if they don't respond, you know, uh, go about your merry business, I think, you know, yeah, not for nothing, but the terrible blog has a two part blog series uh, about how to cold email people, how to send good emails to get responses that yeah. also references that, you know, follow up once, maybe a couple of weeks later and then leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> so go look so, at the terrible blog. On LinkedIn, I had to, for the longest time on my profile, put this sort of gigantic sort of, I do not take unsolicited pitches because, yeah. you know. Well, and that's a legal thing. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> don't send pitches to people. Yeah. And, and, you know, and for a while it worked and it felt like, okay, I think I've got my message. I, I it was so unwieldy under your name, like, but there was no other place. Right. To put, so I got rid of yeah. it. And it hasn't been as much, but it's starting up again where it's like you go to your message and like you can't unsee what is already like this gigantic. And it's just like, that's not how you want to pitch a show. You know, I mm -hmm. get that there may be some challenges in getting your pitch, but understand this from a development point of view at, at a company like Disney. Part of what the development executive job is, is not only to find the next Gravity Falls or the next Phineas and Ferb, but is for that development executive who does find something that we end up optioning has to actually develop that property with the creator. And that's a job. It, you know, if if our development executives took, had to take every pitch, everybody who wanted to pitch, them, they would never have time to develop anything. So, you know, um, you know, look. Disney, the, the the large studios, you know, more often than not, they're not going to take unsolicited pitches. More often than not, they are only going to take pitches that come from agents or managers. And to the degree that our development executives are doing their due diligence and they find somebody or they find an idea out there in the world that they want to touch with, they, they then in those cases, they will reach out to you. If you're asking me, like, so how do you get in? Um, that's a little bit more of a challenging question. I think that you have to recognize that most times the people who are getting shows created at, at TV animation have a history with us. They've worked as a storyboard artist, a director, a writer, a story editor. We've, we have collaborated with them over a long period of time. So now we've built a relationship where if we're looking for a pitch, you know, from them, they are more than prepared to sort of give that. When I sort of referenced earlier about the idea of, you know, when the gentleman asked about, we do take outside pitches, it's, you know, there, there's, there are several caveats in that, you know, oftentimes right. it's with people who, you know, haven't 
tread it into the animation space, but have experience elsewhere in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. or have an agent or have figured out a way like a, a friend of a friend inside. So it's like, hey, would you mind sort of looking at my friend's pitch? That does happen. And to that end, you know, if you're asking me, so how do I get to the friend of the friend thing? Then, right. then my biggest advice to anyone who's looking to get into the animation industry is to, you know, apply to the appropriate jobs that you, that are available. But perhaps more importantly, connect with the community you're trying to get into. So for example, if I'm speaking animation, it's just like, become a member of Women in Animation, become a member of ASIFA, go to the Lightbox Expo, go to the CTN Expo. This is where you're going to meet people. You're going to meet connections. You're going to, even things like this, you know, so, you know, you want to make sure that you are connecting and building relationships at the same time that you're trying to get your, 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 your foot in the door. Because I think that to me is the process in which most people have um, gotten on um, uh, people's radar in terms of, oh, I, yeah, I met them at CTA and he had, you know, he or she had an interesting portfolio or, yeah, I think they're interested in production work, you know, not every job's posted. So you want to do that, you, you know, and again, I know perhaps I'm talking to film, maybe I'm talking to a, a different group here. I, I, I caught myself sort of going to, to do my student outreach mode, but I think it's, it's a similar type of thought process here in terms of, you got to do a couple of different things. You can't just upload a resume to a um, a job and think that's all. That I'm, I'm I'm all done now. You have plenty. You 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 absolutely have to do that. You know, but you also have to then sort of make that effort to sort of get connected with this industry. And I think that's where the that's where the passion of you wanting to be in this industry shows up. That you're involved with a community of people who. Uh, mostly who have figured out a way to get in, but some who are just fans or, and some who are just using that to learn more with workshops and panels so that they're prepared to when opportunity presents itself to come in. Yeah, a thread I'm picking up from, you know, people reaching out to you or to other people uh, from this conversation is just treat people like people. Be genuinely interested in connecting with them and excited about what they're working on. And, you know, more often than not, you being a good person to be around is going to pay off dividends in your Absolutely. career. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that that is... That is the simple way to sort of look at this, you know, just, you know, again, be, be, be humble and be mindful that you're entering someone else's space and, you know, and don't, you know, don't take it personally if, you know, right. you know, because there's a lot of people out there who, who will say, yeah, sure, let's set something up. Yeah, you never know until you ask. Uh, so we have another ask, um, speaking of, from somebody in the audience who, who asks, what are some different jobs related to story that aren't as well known? So in our world, story takes on the sort of capacity of obviously, um, you know, a, a writer in the room, mm -hmm. an actual writer. But story also in our world also can be storyboard artists. And, and the reason I bring this up is because um, um, there are two types of shows that we produce at TV animation um, and the TV animation business in general. There is uh, writer driven and there's storyboard driven. And, you know, depending on the creator's want and wishes and what he or she feels best for the show, that's going to make the most sense for the show. It really depends on their own personal taste. But in a writer driven show, as you might imagine, you know, you have a writer's room and they write scripts and then the scripts go into the art side and everyone moves ahead forward. In a storyboard driven show, you still need a writer's room and you still need writers, but where they stop is at the outline. And then the outline mm -hmm. goes to the crew and, and the storyboard artist in particular is tasked with, in essence, taking that blueprint and building what the show is in pictures, utilizing that blueprint. So you're not gonna have a lot of dialogue in an outline as, as, you, as, as, you, as you know, that's going to be the storyboard artist's job to sort of sort of to sort of hit that up 
Now, not without collaboration, obviously, from the writers, but, you know, I, but again, you know, we are sort of working on a, you know, if we have an order of 20 episodes um, to do, and each episode is to, makes up is made up by two 11 minute episodes. So now you're not talking about 20 stories, you're talking about 40 stories. So even in this process, like once you give the outline in, that writer's on to something else. He, he or she's <laughs> not like so. So the storyboard artist is a, is is responsible for now sort of building what this show is. And as you might imagine, you know that's a skill that not every storyboard artist has, you know? So, so a big part of the decision on whether you do that is like availability of folks who have a natural gift and talent to be able to draw and write equally. Sure. Well. Multi -hyphen it. Um, and like anything else, you, you learn that, you know, you, 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 you sort of come onto a show like that where you're like, Hey, you know, for somebody who's there, it's like as a, you know, storyboard, uh, revisionist or what have you, you're starting to just sort of pick that up in terms of how that works. But that's not easy. And there's not a whole lot of people out there who have those sort of combined skills. So, um, so speaking of that, then yeah, Phineas and Ferb was that for years, like was a storyboard driven big city greens also as well. Very cool. Well, yeah. So speaking of, of preparations, things that people need to be having in mind, we have another audience question. What material should a writer looking to shop their scripts or themselves as a writer prepare? you know, how many scripts do they need? Do they need to have a pitch deck, a treatment? What are you looking for in terms of a package when you're meeting a new writer? Not necessarily to pitch a brand new show and IP, right. but to bring them into the fold. Right, so, uh, and that is a that, that is a very uh, clear distinction. There's the pitching side of it, and then there's the, I wanna be a staff writer. I wanna be a writer on your shows. And right. it's the writers on, my focus tends to be the writers on the show on, on mm -hmm. two levels. Number one, there's the sort of junior writer, apprentice writer level. We have a we have a dedicated uh, uh, TVA animation writing program that uh, that I in my you know we were talking earlier about my expanded role. It's, it's been during this time that I wanted to sort of create this program because in the past we would get we would get really good samples at, of writers who had potential. They weren't ready to be staff writers yet, but there was something in these scripts. But there was nothing we could do with them because mm -hmm. we didn't have a training program. We didn't have the ability to put them on our budget, you know, for the shows because TV budgets are not feature budgets. And, you know, you every every sort of penny has been accounted for. So it would always just break my heart where it's just like, yeah, kind of go away and get some experience and then come back. Like, well, your, your reaction would be like any anyway, like. But if everyone's saying that to me, how do I, you know, where do I get the experience yeah. so that I have enough so, experience? With this so story? part of that is, you know, you know, just writing so much that you're just getting better and better and that you, you know, you, your samples will make it such so that you just can't be denied whether or not you have three years experience or not. It's just like, yeah, but this is really good. So someone's going to give you a chance there. But with this program, it now allows us to sort of, take a green writer and sort of train that person while they're in the writer's room. And that's the unique thing about this, this program. It's working in the writer's room. So it's not a whole lot of workshops and, and you know, uh, uh, story presentations and conversations. It's, it's, it's literally like boots on the ground, work in the room. It's, a, it's an official union position. And our show creators and our story editors are the ones who are going to train you while at the same time they're making high level animated content for Disney. Um, so that was the, you know, the challenge with that program was aligning everybody up to see the potential there on, on that. So, so, but what is also unique about this is like, there's no application. People always ask me, how do I apply for that? It's your sample. And when you were asking me the, the question from the audience was like, how many? It can be one, it can be 10. What I'm looking for is your best work. And, you know, the one sample that I read that, you know, delves into this character dimensionality and character development that is like moving the needle creatively for me and others who read this stuff, you know, 
that's what is your calling card. So your portfolio doesn't from from my point, like I don't need this. I don't need I don't need six scripts to then be able to make a decision on whether or not you're going to I need one solid sample. And that is what I'm going to utilize. That is sort of the the ticket to move it to our crews who ultimately are it's our crews. It's not me who decide who they're going to hire. They're so there's no application. There's no application. How does, how does so, the perfect sample get to you? So you email it to me. This is why I do these. You email sure, it sure, to sure. you, you know, when I do these presentations and typically it's at schools, but in this particular case, I am very scarily gracious with my email. Um, and I've been told, don't do that. You're crazy. It's like, but again, in all, in all seriousness, it's like, why not? It's my job, you know, and it's just like, so I, you know, if I, if I want to have that connection, I got to make the effort as well. I got to meet people halfway there. So bottom line, you want to be clear it, unsolicited script submissions. So, how, so basically just to get the rules correct. Yeah. So, you know, right now for folks who are listening to me right now, it's like, I, I share my email with them. They can write me and say, hey, I got a script I would like to send you. Is that okay? I say, sure. I'm going to send you this release form. Fill sure. out that release form and then send me in your sample. Or you can send me in your sample with, with the email you have. I'm not going to open it up until I get the release form for you. Right. That is the application process to this. Because the wow. reality is like what we wanted to make sure happened was that we weren't caught up in the big long application and what you have done and mm -hmm. because ultimately, yeah because, and, and put you in front of 10 judges to it because ultimately we just we want to read your sample and go from there you know and look because i do that so much i'm not going to sit here and say and you know what i read every single single thing that's submitted to me for sure i i can't i'm a I'm, my division is a division of one you're looking at them so Hopefully in the future, there will be more people that can help with that. I mean, I do share around samples if I, if I get, when I have the opportunity to read them and I, and they move the needle for me creatively, I share them around. Ultimately, when a crew is looking for that junior writer position, now I have some options to share with them. That is the same process that they hire staff writers on. So that's why we sort of wanted to fundamentally keep the same process going. So sure. that's what you need. Pipeline in. open. Yeah. And that's why also I, you know, I don't public I don't publicly say, hey, the deep TBA writing program deadline is like because there is no deadline. Even when we don't have any openings, my job is to find this talent and is to read samples. So I think the reality is, you know. We don't need to sort of publicly promote this in a way where it's like all it's going to do is give me 500 more scripts that I don't right. have time to read. So, so I want to be very sort of selective, you know, and in the and in, in, and I choose my events uh, closely, you know, just for for that very reason. I I select my schools for that very reason, just to be able to sort of narrow down and pinpoint, you know, where I'm getting my scripts. Now, the other thing is part of the reason I do this is because I don't want to, and I shouldn't just rely on schools. Not everybody can go to school. Not everybody can be at NYU or can afford Savannah or, you know, or circumstances are such that they didn't want or need to go to school. So I do not want to sort of cut out where, again, we look, we, I just look for talent wherever talent is. And talent isn't just found in LA and New York. And it's not just found at film schools and it's not necessarily found at schools in general. So I try to broaden my scope and reach as much as I can um, with the understanding that obviously, you know, schools are an important part of this process. Writing programs sure. are an important part of this process. But um, try to make sure that the my word gets out to as many people as possible within the scope of somebody who would be interested in this world. Well, that's lovely. Well, we are unfortunately at the end of our time. I can't believe how fast this has gone. So Jay, thank you so much. Do you have a final piece of like everyone in the audience who obviously wants to work in the media industry in one way or another, what should our next step be? You know, if you leave us with one thing to do after we get yeah, off this. Well, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, like, and again, I can, I, I can more speak to the animation side, but 
Sure. Get connected to the, uh, you, you know, especially in, in, if you're in LA or New York, it's more, and even more importantly now during the pandemic, where it's like the level field has been a little bit more even now because there are certain events that you can now participate in that don't require you getting an airplane and flying to LA and then getting a hotel and then like, you know, um, a lot of these different um, workshops and panel events and expos and stuff are are virtual now, like whether it's a New York Comic Con or, you know, whatever. But it's really do your, do your homework about the industry. Follow the blogs. If you're interested in TV animation, make sure you know who are the players, what, you know, whether it's Netflix, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon. Who are the independents? Bento Box, Titmouse, Oddbot, Wild Canary. There are a whole lot of different entryways into our business that aren't just Disney, Netflix, Cartoon Network. You know, so so do your homework, do your do, and then understand the type of programming that they do. You know, as much as I am hopeful, and I'm not even a big anime fan, but I understand its appeal and its power. That Disney Plus, because we have this new platform now, may be scratching the surface a little bit there. That's great. But look at what TV animation is. Don't come to me with a portfolio filled with anime. Like, it's not what we do. So just do a little bit of homework and some due diligence there. Um, um, and um, just connect up with that community you want to be part of is, is like, the, I think, the best advice I can give you. Well, that's I, I love ending a conversation with, hey, go meet more people. People are interesting and exciting and absolutely being a, being amongst them is important. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Jay, for hey, your my time. Pleasure. I'm glad I'm <laughs> glad to be here and um, um, have a great rest of the show. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, for our for our final beats, thank you all for joining us. Thanks again to Jay for being here, for for participating, for for answering questions. To all of you for asking questions. Uh, as a reminder, Sterable Fest is presented by Dell Technologies with Nvidia, making workstation and monitor solutions for purpose built creators like you, who might be the next big, you know, Phineas and Ferb creators. So we'll see you next time. Which right now is, I think, right now at five p.m. There is a happy hour with this year's Sterable Fest official selection. So you need to rub shoulders, get to do that meeting thing that Jay just recommended. And then from 6 to 7 p.m. today, they will have their annual Creator Achievement Award. This year honoring Derek Waters, an actor, comedian, screenwriter, producer, and director who is possibly best known for his work on the television series Drunk History, which earned him eight Primetime Emmy Award nominations. You don't want to miss that, and we don't want to miss you. So we hope you stick around. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.